Greetings, everyone. The time has come for me to talk to you about my favorite instrument. We have the Behringer Neutron. Now, if you don't know anything at all about analog synthesis, that's, that's the assumption that I'm going off of, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. These analog synthesizers really came to prominence in the 1970s and 80s. Prior to their existence, if you wanted to sh have a film score, just record a film score. You required an entire orchestra. <clears throat> so when you got a device like this that could synthesize the sound of a flute or a guitar, it was a really big deal. No longer did you have the inconvenience of having to arrange an orchestra. You could just have a person in a room with some tape recorders and they could put together each piece as it was needed and combine them. So there was a lot of raw potential and that meant that these things really exploded in popularity. Now I mentioned offhand in my last video if you were born after a certain date there may be some things that you don't know. Well that's because in the 80s synthesizers got so overused that they kind of fell out of popularity. At some point Everyone turned their back on them and said, it's inauthentic. It's not a real instrument. You're just trying to replace traditional musicians. It's not cool. So when I was coming of age, these devices weren't really popular anymore, not mainstream. And so I've had to go back and learn some things because now they're becoming popular again. And not just to make the sound of traditional instruments, but to make weird alien sounds that, that you can't get anywhere else, like really cool bass sounds. So that's some background on music synthesis in general. Now the other thing to know is that, I mean, while no one would describe this as small, traditional synthesizers like the kind that Wendy Carlos used, they were massive. They took up entire rooms. And each of these sections that you see here, you'll notice these borders on the unit each of these sections would have been their own individual module all wired together. Here we've taken advantage of modern manufacturing techniques and mass production to inexpensively and uh, I should say affordably and conveniently put all of these things together in the way that they would normally be arranged in a rack. And I'm going to talk about each of these modules in the in the in these videos. But the first thing that I want to talk about is, you know, the heart of any synthesis module, the heart of any synthesizer, and that's your uh, your oscillators. So when you're producing sound, what you've got is a wave. And you could think of that as the electricity that runs through a speaker that causes that speaker diaphragm to move in and out, right? Those waves, that's what gets set up on these two oscillators. Here we have two oscillators. Now, and I told you, you know, I got gangster production values here, right? Um, so <laughs> here's my graph of the different waves that you could produce. You have one that's a sine wave that moves in and out real smooth, right? Here we've got a square wave and that's a, a, a more sharp movement. Here we have a triangular wave, right? So it's more, you know, each of these are going to make a different sound. This saw, this sawtooth wave, that's what we call this. You'll notice it has a ramp and a fall off. Now each of these waves have very different characteristics. You know, a sawtooth, I'm sorry, a sine wave is real smooth and singing. A, a square wave is very interesting because we can get these hollow tones. With a triangle wave, it's hard to explain. I explain it as the bass sound that you hear on a Nintendo Entertainment System, right? You hear uh, Paperboy, boom, 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 boom. That's your triangle wave, right? Your sawtooth wave is, is more cutting. So we can see these right here going down the side of each oscillator. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about this top wave here in a minute, but you can see as I turn this down, I get square waves, right? Now I'm going to play a note and let you hear a square wave. Right? 
Hold on, I think maybe that was a bit low. Adjust my levels here. There we go. Okay, so there's your square wave. Let's listen to the sawtooth wave. Hear that difference? It's almost like listening to a trumpet. Let's listen to that NES bass I talked about, that triangle wave. Isn't that cool? I'm going to listen to our singing sine wave. Okay. So, yeah, and like I said, <clears throat> we have two of these things. Now, I'm going to show you one of the most useful features of this synthesizer right now. You can auto-tune it. Like, these, these knobs are here, they control the tuning of the oscillator. So, check this out. This controls the mix between them. So I'm just, I'm just going to turn it all the way over to this one oscillator. Now, if you want that tune to see, you've got a problem. You can try to tune it by ear, or you could try to use an acoustic tuner. There's an easier way. If you hold down this range button, you're going to start blinking, right? This means it's in tuning mode. Now, I'm going to hit a C on my keyboard, and this light over here is moving this way. All I have to do is adjust this guy until just the top light is lit on this shape. It's real tender. There. Perfect. Now I hit the button again. You have to hold it in. Okay. Now it's tuned perfectly to C. Okay. Also, it's worth noting that when you first fire up your Behringer Neutron, it is going to be out of tune. Uh, it changes as it warms up. It's going to change. And so you might need to restart the thing after about 20 minutes and do your tuning or, or just do the tuning again. This is common of all analog synthesizers. As the circuits warm up, they're going to change a little bit. Now again, I, I said that we have an oscillator mix, so it's entirely possible. Let's go on, move this back to the middle. And you'll notice this one's still, oops, sorry, hit mic. This one is still out of tune. So I'm gonna hold down range, and I'm gonna tune this guy. Right. From the camera angle, you can't really see this top lid, but it's here and it's lit. Okay. Now I have both my oscillators in tune. Um, this one right here sets the range you're operating in. So right now it's way too high to even hear. I'm going to put them both on 8. The range is just the... the number of octaves that you're covering or that the oscillator can cover at any given time all right so we've talked about setting the pitch we've talked about tuning it we've talked about that we can set the mix between the two oscillators we've talked about our shapes roughly you'll notice i knocked this one out of tune again <laughs> you can get some cool sounds by putting them out of tune with one another. Let me just move it back over to the left oscillator. Uh, right down here, this sets the pulse width. Now when we talk about pulse width, we're actually talking about the distance between the pulses. And when you change that, this is actually important on a square wave. I'm gonna show you on the square wave. I'm gonna move these all back up to square wave. When this is set just right, you get a real traditional hollow sound from your square wave.
right there. So pulse width control, very interesting. This is again the heart of this is where your sound starts. These waves, you're going to choose one depending on the kind of instrument that you're trying to emulate or the try kind of sound that you're trying to get. The only other way that I haven't talked about is unique to Behringer Neutron as far as I know. They call this tone mod and it's, I can't get a lot of information on it, but it seems like a square wave that acts a little bit differently with regard to pulse width. So just a, another sound option for you. And it's worth noting that you can dial between these two shapes. So you can get something that's a cross between a square wave and a sawtooth. So it's really good for dialing in uh, very specific sounds. Now we've talked about that. Um, let's look at the default routing of the Neutron. And you don't have to know what all of these things are right now. But knowing that there is a default routing, this is important. This, is, this has to do with the signal chain, right? We've been talking about the oscillators. This is where everything starts. These are the sounds we've been talking about. Then it goes through a voltage controlled filter. Again, we, you know, I'm gonna do a whole other video on that. Then it goes through the overdrive, then a voltage controlled amplifier, which is, uh, you know, anyway, then through delay and then to output. What I want to say, what I started to say, and what I'm going to say about these two things, you'll notice that the voltage controlled filter uh, is influenced by both the LFO and the envelope too. And they're, they're both attenuated with these two knobs. In, in a similar way, you have another envelope for your voltage controlled amplifier. That's envelope one and a VCA bias. So this is the default routing. And the reason that I'm bringing this to your attention, it's important to know this because you'll notice that the overdrive is baked in and there's no way to actually switch it off on here. You can't just bypass it with a switch or something. And I think that's intentional when they talk about, you know, this synth having its own character, that it's real bassy out of the gate and that it, it seems to be uh, overdriven out of the box. That is the reason why and it's the distinctive sound of this synth and if that's what you're going for that's great. But if you're trying to get like classic Moogie sounds or you're trying to maybe um, copy some of your traditional sounds that's going to get into your way. And so what I want to do right now I'm going to show you the most useful patch <laughs> on the Behringer Neutron. We are going to work together we're going to bypass that overdrive so that uh, it's not clipping the top end and you can get some of those traditional sounds. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to go from the VCF into the VCA, right? But we're not going to go straight there because that is a really loud signal. We're going to need to attenuate it. And your attenuator is going to give you a, like a volume control that allows you to turn it down, right? So let's go from VCF one into attenuator one and we'll go out of attenuator one into where we're trying to get into the VCA, right? So into the VCA. Now, if I try playing now, you're not going to hear anything because my attenuator is turned all the way down. I'm going to start turning it up. There it is. Okay. Now there's videos online of people trying to bypass the overdrive and they're using like five cables. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know why they don't just like look at the manual and yeah, that's all you have to do. Folks, it only takes two patch cables, not a big deal. So with that, you have bypassed the overdrive and now you can get your clean tones and you can follow along with you know, pretty much any synth patch book and translate it directly to the Neutron and get those classic sounds. So most useful patch there is bypassing the overdrive if that's what you want. All right, I think that's enough for one video. I've, I've gone on for 14 minutes. What did we cover? We covered our oscillator section, uh, and we covered bypassing the overdrive so that we have just a clean signal. This in and of itself gives you a lot to play with. I've showed you how to tune your, your, your oscillator. So just with this, you could start producing music. Um, I would say if, if you've just pulled your Neutron out of the box, you're also going to want to check the dip switches on the back. 
the configuration of those dip switches set what MIDI channel this thing is listening on. So for example, if you flip them all down, which is what that's how this one is set up, that's MIDI channel one. And also, if you're having trouble getting sound, check your manual there uh, right at the uh, the preset patches section. This is page 22 of the manual. Right here, this graphic shows you how to put it in basically an empty patched mode, which is what I started this video with. So if you do this, if you set your dip switches for the proper MIDI channel, you're going to get sound out of this thing. All right, guys, thanks a lot for tuning in, and I hope that some of this was helpful. I hope it gives you something to play with initially, and then uh, when we come back, I'll start talking to you about the filter.